Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us for our first live virtual healthy living event, heart health and stroke prevention. Now tonight we have three amazing doctors who are gonna to present to you. And this information is actually information that could save your life. We're going to try and do it quickly. You'll be with us for probably less than an hour. So we're gonna move right along. If you're joining us tonight from Facebook, or YouTube, you can actually ask the doctors questions right there in the comments. We have a team of people monitoring those sites. They'll bring the questions to the doctors and you'll get your answers in real time right here while you're watching. So I hope that helps. It's kind of like a appointment with the doctor, although you're doing it right from home. So we hope that's helpful for you. Now tonight we are happy to have Dr. Luay Al-Khattab, who's board certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular disease, and interventional cardiology. And Dr. Mohammed Al-Khazmi, a vascular neurologist, is going to talk to us about stroke. So we have both of them still coming up, but first I'm very happy and honored to bring to you Dr. Philip McDonald, Dr. McDonald is going to address concerns you might have about COVID-19 and how safe it is to return to the hospital. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> and today we're going to talk a little bit about what the state of COVID-19 is in the state in Genesee County and at Hurley Hospital. Uh, so let's have to move on here. Okay, <clears throat> we're in business. So um, a couple of background slides. As we know, COVID-19 is a respiratory virus that spreads primarily from person to person through uh, cough, sneezes, uh, close contact as well. I really like this slide, uh, this graphic, and uh, it goes through from low to high the uh, likelihood of transmitting COVID-19 from person to person. Uh, if no one's wearing a mask, as we understand, the uh, transmission probability is quite high. Uh, if a healthy person is wearing a mask, but uh, the carrier isn't, uh, there's a slightly decreased chance of transmissibility. If everyone's wearing masks, we know that uh, there's a very low likelihood of transmission of this virus. And that's what we're promoting. Everyone in the community should be wearing masks when possible, social distancing, uh, staying at home when possible as well. Uh, COVID-19 also can be present on surfaces, objects, uh, and this is why disinfection of commonly touched items is very important. Uh, things like, as you can see, laptop, mouse, pens, doorknobs, and uh, as the state starts to reopen, this is what all the businesses uh, in our community will be doing. They all have plans in place. Our hospital does as well, and I'll get into okay. that a little bit more later. We're in business, so. So uh, in order to reduce your risk of uh, acquiring COVID-19, uh, here's a list of things that you can be doing. Cleaning your hands often, uh, coughing or sneezing in your bent elbow, not in your hands, avoiding touching your eyes, nose, and mouth, limiting social gatherings and time spent in crowded places, avoiding close contact with someone who's sick, and cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched surfaces. Uh, and this has one meter, but uh, I stole this from the World Health Organization. It's a really good graphic, but here we're practicing a distance of about six feet. So here's a timeline of events when it comes to COVID-19 uh, in the country and in the state. On January 21st, we saw our first case confirmed here in the US on um, February uh, 28th, uh, the State of Michigan Emergency Operations Center was activated on March 10th. The first two cases of COVID-19 were confirmed in Michigan. March 23rd, Governor Whitmer issued her, issued her stay at home order. And on April 24th, uh, masks were required while in public, which was a very important step forward. Uh, all of these uh, data are available through MDHHS, which is the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, you can see there at the bottom. This was pulled uh, a little over a week ago, so it may be slightly out of date, but the overall trend of uh, daily new COVID-19 cases in the state of Michigan is down, as you can see. <clears throat> daily new deaths, similarly, the overall trend is down, which is important. Uh, hospital resource utilization, it peaked around the middle of April, 
Uh, and the entire goal behind the social distancing, uh, staying at home when possible, is to reduce transmission so that our already overburdened healthcare system uh, didn't become even more overwhelmed. And this is what we've accomplished. So we have to keep moving forward. Uh, this is data from Genesee County. Uh, and this is actually available through uh, the state of Michigan website as well. It's right at the top um, under the coronavirus section. You can break it down by a region and county. As you can see here, new cases uh, in Genesee County are on the downtrend, as we know, about 3.3 daily new cases. Uh, there's some breakdown down at the bottom here by age and by ethnicity, uh, deaths on the downtrend as well. And testing is increasing, which uh, we, we have to be able to adequately test people uh, when they're symptomatic. And also now we're uh, venturing into the realm of asymptomatic testing as we try to open up the state. Uh, you can see that the anticipated number of tests that are being performed per day is increasing slowly. And uh, you can see in the county that we're in, about 442 uh, daily tests are administered, and the percent positivity on those tests has been declining. So as of again about a week ago, only 2.6% of uh, tests were positive. And uh, there are some thresholds over there on the right side of the screen. Uh, we're in that uh, medium category of 3 to 10%, uh, technically still, although we soon will be in that next phase. Uh, this is um, the My Safe Start plan, actually, that uh, the governor came up with. And that's also freely available on the State of Michigan website. And so we are in that four to five range right now, improving and containing this infection. Social distancing is working. I really like this graphic too. Uh, the mobility in the state of Michigan uh, has, you can see, decreased significantly. So this is compared to baseline, how much we're moving around. And you may have seen in the news recently that we're doing a great job. So how is Hurley protecting our healthcare workers and patients? Uh, number one is universal masking. So um, we actually started this on the 10th of April. All healthcare workers, patients, and visitors will be wearing medical grade masks while they're inside uh, Hurley Medical Center. Uh, they're provided at the entrances. Sanitizing stations are also located throughout. Uh, and then healthcare workers who are providing care for patients with COVID-19 will also be wearing additional uh, personal protective equipment, including face shields, eye protection, gowns, and gloves. All uh, people who are entering the healthcare center are going to be uh, screened. They are being screened right now, symptomatically. Uh, if healthcare workers themselves develop symptoms, they're instructed to immediately call off and proceed to occupational health for testing. And of course, symptomatic visitors aren't allowed. All of these graphics, um, it's worth noting, are available on our Facebook page. And uh, this one in particular lists the symptoms of COVID-19. Visitor restrictions uh, have been in place since the beginning of the pandemic in order to contain the spread of the disease. Uh, but as the disease burden in the community has decreased, we're now starting to allow some visitation in order to provide social support to the patients. Uh, and as you can see, oh, here we go. Uh, visitor restrictions are being reevaluated on an ongoing basis uh, based on guidance from the CDC. And as of right now, um, still patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19 um, can't have any visitors. However, um, adult ED patients can have one primary caregiver, pediatric ED patients, one primary caregiver, and we're expanding this in the clinics as well to include more individuals. Testing, um, we developed actually at the beginning of the pandemic, a comprehensive testing algorithm, uh, and all testing is now being done in-house at Hurley rather than being sent out highly sensitive and specific DNA-based testing. Uh, and we have one test in particular, it's called the BioFire, that's um, the result is available in one and a half hours approximately. Uh, universal testing, regardless of symptoms, is being done for certain patient populations, including uh, OB inductions and C-sections, upcoming surgeries or other aerosol generating procedures, all ICU admissions and admissions to behavioral health, uh, patients from these other settings, congregate settings, and of course, immunocompromised patients. We also have antibody testing available. Uh, this is being done at these urgent cares, the locations you can see here. And if anyone's symptomatic, of course, we can do the nasal swab PCR-based testing as well. There are designated uh, COVID-19 care areas. 
uh, within certain units of the hospital with dedicated nursing staff, and these areas are only accessed by essential personnel. Uh, inpatient rehabilitation is also available for patients who have recovered from COVID-19. We have a very comprehensive treatment algorithm, which is also being continuously updated um, in collaboration with my other infectious disease colleagues. Uh, convalescent plasma is something that we've been using. It's available through the Red Cross and uh, the direct acting antiviral drug um, remdesivir that's also available for patients with severe disease. Uh, this is being provided to us by the state. The Xenex, which I think is everyone's favorite robot, uh, this is something that we are using in uh, patient rooms, including ICU and COVID patient rooms, to reduce um, the burden of the organism in the environment. And it works by UV light, which inactivates uh, the virus so it can't replicate and be transmitted. We're also doing contact tracing as, again, the disease burden uh, decreases in the community. Uh, we are paying more attention. It's not community spread anymore. We're paying more attention to everyone's contact. So if someone comes into the hospital with COVID-19, we're tracking that person's contacts, isolating those people in order to uh, further contain its spread. Outpatient clinics. So Hurley is open. Our clinics are open and prepared to meet your healthcare needs. Uh, and we're instituting a number of different measures to protect you as listed here. Uh, we're spacing chairs for social distancing, staggering appointments to avoid uh, keeping too many people in the waiting room at the same time. Uh, symptomatic patients are immediately taken back into an exam room. Uh, you'll have limited contact with unnecessary people while you're visiting us. Uh, masks are provided to everybody and telemedicine visits are also available. So at this time, uh, we'll hand it over for some questions from Facebook, YouTube, and various other places. Um, someone says, my doctor would like to schedule a procedure for me in the hospital. Isn't it safer to wait another month? So that's an excellent question. And it really depends on the urgency of the procedure. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were saying, yes, we should be avoiding procedures that um, are not needed for life-threatening conditions. But now as um, the COVID-19 community spread has decreased, we're starting to open this back up in accordance with uh, state recommendations and CDC guidelines. So <clears throat> we are testing everyone, uh, even if they're asymptomatic, who is going to have a procedure. And uh, we're not suggesting that anyone delay um, necessary procedures any longer. You'll have to discuss with your provider uh, if the procedure is necessary, but by all means, um, we are open and ready for surgeries. And you've covered what the hospital is doing, but one person wants to know if it's still dangerous to come into the emergency room. Uh, in terms of COVID-19 risk, uh, certainly it's not dangerous to come in here. The ED um, is one of the places that we're spending the most effort and attention in uh, making sure all of our healthcare workers are wearing and uh, receiving the appropriate PPE. So down there, you'll see everyone wearing uh, appropriate masks, face protection. Uh, and as I said, we are limiting the number of people who are coming in and out of the ED, including um, visitors. So you're definitely very safe to come into the ED uh, if you need to. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were suggesting that if you didn't need to come to the ED, you can stay at home. That's still true. But at the same time, we're doing everything in our power to um, protect patients and healthcare workers from acquiring the virus. And I love that we have an expert like you to address people because there's so much conflicting information. Somebody's saying, will an antibody test tell me if I've had COVID-19? Also an excellent question. And it's one that we get a lot, even from other healthcare professionals. So there are a lot of different antibody test products out there. Um, and some of them have been approved fairly hastily, in my opinion. Um, we do have some antibody testing available, like I said early. Um, I can't speak for outside testing. Uh, the one that we have uh, is pretty good, uh, but it may not with 100% accuracy tell us if someone has been exposed to COVID in the past. There is some cross reactivity when it comes to this test. So it might pick up other coronaviruses. It might pick up other viruses like RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. So if it's positive, you may have been exposed to COVID-19 or you may not have. So it may point us in one direction, but it's not diagnostic by any means. If you're symptomatic, then uh, the PCR-based testing, uh, the DNA-based testing, that is much more sensitive and specific. All right. 
Thank you so much, Dr. McDonald, uh, for being here. It was a lot of great information. It's my Thanks. pleasure. Thank you. Okay, during the Thank you so much and thank you everybody for joining us uh, this evening. I'll be speaking about the neurological manifestations of COVID-19. We got some very important information from Dr. McDonald's before about the infectious disease itself part or aspect of it, but how about the neurological aspect? And again, to uh, reiterate some of the numbers we know as of now, uh, worldwide we actually have more than 8 million. This number has increased since the slides were uh, were uh, put together and we have over 8 million people uh, suffering from COVID-19 worldwide. And the United States itself, we are over 2 million people also infected with COVID-19. In Michigan, we have 66,000 people who have tested positive. And until now, unfortunately, we have very close to 120,000 uh, deaths uh, because of COVID-19. So it's definitely a disease that raises the eyebrows. It's a new disease. We are still learning quite a bit as we are going forward. Much of the questions come about COVID-19 and the brain. How does it really affect the brain? Now, COVID-19, the virus itself, uh, basically attaches to a receptor called the ACE2 receptor. And ACE2 receptors do not exist in the brain, uh, but they do exist in the arteries and the endothelium, as well as in the lungs tissue. But those are two separate organs that do not exist in the brain. So a big question came up, how can the virus itself get to the brain? And there's a couple of different theories. One of them was about the thrombotic, uh, uh, basically evolution of the virus and what it produces. Also the inflammatory process of the virus itself. And there's probably more uh, evidence nowadays that the inflammatory process is very, very important and probably essential. Just two days ago, there was a big study that came from England, uh, the recovery study, where it showed that uh, using steroids in patients who are severely affected with COVID-19 might actually be helpful. So there's more suggestion that the inflammatory process is very much a, uh, a big process with, uh, with, the, uh, with the infection. How about thrombosis? Well, we have more and more data that actually uh, patients with COVID-19 can also get infected and can have uh, stroke-like symptoms or full-blown strokes in patients who are actually young. And we'll go over some of those studies you know, as we go along. How about the treatment? Aside from treating the virus directly, which clever people like Dr. McDonald's help us quite a bit with that, when it comes to the neurological manifestations, we actually concentrate on the disease itself and we try to address the disease as, uh, as an entity and treat it in that way. So by talking about that, there are three different systems that potentially can be affected with COVID-19 when it comes to the nerves and the neurons. The first one is the central nervous system. And with that, the typical symptoms are usually headaches, uh, dizziness, uh, people can lose consciousness, they can become confused, uh, they can hallucinate actually. They also have difficulty with ambulation, something called ataxia. And most importantly, recently, there's been more reports about young people affected with COVID-19 ending up with a large stroke. Also, it can affect the peripheral nervous system where patients can have difficulty with their smell, with their taste, also sometimes visual problems. COVID-19 can affect the muscles directly, leading to increased enzymes in the muscles. And there's multiple different symptoms that people present us with uh, when it comes to the nervous system and COVID-19. The most common of them is basically dizziness. 
Headache also is another manifestation and can be very serious, especially if there's an underlying severe inflammatory process in the brain itself. Something called encephalitis or meningitis, an inflammation of the lining of the brain or the brain itself. Now, with men meningitis and encephalitis, we're seeing a peculiar kind of picture, which is hemorrhagic encephalitis, a rather severe case. Typically, we only see in the young people, but we are seeing it now in adults as well, infected with the virus. Also, COVID-19 can affect the vasculature, leading to thrombosis and stroke-like symptoms. Um, the peripheral nervous system is typically affected with people having difficulty with their smell, with their taste, or even have sometimes visual symptoms where the nerve of the eye, uh, the optic nerve basically, can be affected. Muscle aches, generalized aches, can also be part of COVID-19. A study that came from Wuhan uh, basically followed patients, over 200 of them, that were infected with the disease and looked at their neurological manifestation. 40% were severe and about 60% were less severe. And the most common symptoms that we've seen with that, again, was dizziness. Patients also, up to 5% of, of them actually were affected with stroke-like symptoms. And we had a, uh, a study coming from New York not long time ago where they, they described multiple patients, relatively young. Most of them are in their 30s that had actually been... Uh, uh, got symptoms of stroke after being infected with the virus itself. And their NIH stroke scale, a scale we use to check the severity of their stroke, was relatively high. Their large vessels were occluded. And if we're talking about stroke, maybe it's good to basically clarify what kind of strokes there are. And there's two big types, what we call ischemic, where a clot occludes an artery, or a hemorrhagic, where there's a rupture of the artery. The ischemic strokes, under that, there's four different categories where there's a cardioembolic phenomena, a clot from the heart travels to the brain, what we call a large vessel disease, typically the carotid arteries or even the aorta as it exits the heart. There's a clot from there that travels all the way up to the brain. Small vessel disease, typically we see that in people who have cholesterol problem, hypertension, and elderly. And my favorite is idiopathic, where despite our best efforts, we really do not know what caused the stroke. Now, when it comes to COVID-19, most of those patients had a large vessel occlusion with NI stroke scale rather high. Also, hemorrhagic strokes comes with either a rupture of an artery or a subarachnoid hemorrhage where the blood is all over the place. There are cells that we can salvage, and time is really neuron, time is brain. With every minute, there's over a million neuron cells that we typically lose if we don't get an immediate treatment. And that's why we always ask people with any signs of stroke, try to get to emergency room as soon as possible. Come to Hurley and we'll take care of you. When there is damage to the brain, unfortunately, damage can be permanent. So time is neuron, time is brain. A clot can occlude an artery, and if there is a cessation of the flow to that part of the brain, then there is a permanent damage to that area. And depending on the damage, then the symptoms can appear. Also, typically, we try to salvage area around the damaged area, what we call a penumbra, where it's an area of the brain that has less flow, keeps it kind of an electric quiescence, meaning it's alive but non-functional. And we try to salvage those areas with multiple different intervention that we can do at Hurley Hospital. I want you to think and I want you to be fast. Be fast is an acronym the American Heart Association had came up for people to actually remember symptoms and signs of stroke. The B stands for balance, E is for I, any visual disturbances, double vision or loss of vision. F stands for face, facial droop. Um, A stands for an arm, where an arm becomes weak and droops down. S is for speech and T is for time, time really of an essence. Also, if you witnessed any of your uh, loved people having sign -like, uh, stroke-like symptoms, then try to record the time of onset. It's very important for us in the emergency room. 
So why come to Hurley? Hurley is a primary stroke center. And that means that we put ourselves, we put ourselves to very high standards that's set forth by the American Heart and American Stroke Association, where we have to get certain tests within a very limited uh, period of time. A patient with stroke, when they come in, there's multiple nurses that rush them immediately to their room. They speak with the ER physician to attend them within certain time, less than 10 minutes. They ha we have to get a CAT scan of the brain with less than 30 minutes. So there are standards that we always keep with each and every single patient that comes to our emergency room with stroke-like symptoms. We also have to get reading on those CAT scan within uh, 15 minutes. If we administer a medication, the clot buster, TPA, then this has to be done with less than 60 minutes. And actually, our last data has been under 50 minutes. So we are well within that range. We're doing really a good job. There's neurologists always on board, either physically in the hospital or by phone discussing it with the ER physician. And we also potentially can delegate uh, further workup, including endovascular, if needed. So the virus can affect the nerves as well and can affect the peripheral nerves in a way that numbness and tingling can be uh, one of the leading symptoms. Also, walking difficulty can be a leading symptom. A condition called Guillain-Barre, where it's an ascending paralysis. The nerves are affected. People can get numbness and tingling from the feet all the way up. This could also be a dangerous situation. If the nerves of the diaphragm are affected, then people's breathing can be affected as well. And if not treated in right time, people can die. This also is a disease that can affect people's mentation as well as coordination. They have ataxia, incoordination, difficulty with ambulation. They walk like a drunk without drinking, of course. And um, we can treat patients with stroke. So in summary, COVID-19 is a novel disease. We are still learning of this disease as we are going along. There is a lot of questions that remains in mind. We don't know all the ins and outs about it, but we know that definitely it affects the nervous system in up to 40% of cases with COVID-19. COVID-19 also um, affect the neurons and the brain, where roughly 36% of patients can end up with stroke-like symptoms a disease that is very time sensitive. If any patient with stroke-like symptoms are seen, they have to be attended to as soon as possible. Coming to our emergency room at Hurley Hospital is actually safer than you think. I've had many patients, unfortunately, that waited on their stroke symptoms, sometimes for days. And if we miss the window of treatment, unfortunately, not much can be done later on, aside from trying to make sure that the risk factors are lessened as much, as much as possible. I want you to be safe, but I also wanted to remember the acronyms Be Fast. B is for balance, E is for eye, F is for face, A is for arm, S is for speech, and T is for time. Stay safe. Now, if people or viewers are watching um, on Facebook or YouTube, they can submit their questions there. And we do have some questions coming in for you, Dr. El Kazmi. Um, this is a good one because let's face it, we've all been stressed the last few months. Can stress cause a stroke? That's an excellent question, actually. So directly, probably not. Indirectly, yes. Stress, number one, there are studies to suggest that stress can actually affect our inflammatory process in our body. The immune system is suppressed during stressful situation. And if our immune system is down, then yes, multiple diseases can occur. Also stress bring the blood pressure up. One of the most common modifiable risk factor for stroke is hypertension. And if the blood pressure is high, that increases risk for stroke, be it ischemic stroke where clot can develop or hemorrhagic stroke where there's a rupture of the artery. So maybe not directly, but indirectly, yes. You just mentioned hypertension is one of the risk factors. Are there other risk factors for stroke? Absolutely. There's multiple risk factors for stroke. There is what we call modifiable risk factors, things we can do something about. Hypertension is number one. Diabetes, keeping very tight control of your sugar. Cholesterol is very important. 
That's one of the things we do at Hurley Hospital. When patients come in, we make sure their LDL, the bad cholesterol, is low enough safely. Also, people with sleep apnea potentially can have higher risk for stroke. So we try to screen people for that. People with sedentary lifestyle who don't exercise. Multiple studies have shown that people who exercise regularly, their risk for stroke, heart disease, uh, diabetes, or control over blood pressure is much better. So we always recommend to patients to make sure that they exercise regularly. Also nutrition is very important. Oftentimes we recommend Mrs. Dash's diet or the Mediterranean diet or the lion heart diet or really any healthy diet for people to follow to reduce their risk of heart attacks as well as strokes. So that's the modifiable risk factors. Unfortunately, there is also things we cannot do much about what we call an unmodifiable risk factor for stroke. The number one is age. After the age of 55, our risk for stroke doubles every decade just by the mere fact of us aging. Um, that doesn't mean that every person of the age of 55 end up in a stroke. Absolutely not. If you follow those rigorous, you know, activities, nutrition, make sure that you're eating healthy, your blood pressure under control, you're taking medication and you're following with your doctor's recommendation, then the risk for stroke drops down significantly. Um, someone's a little concerned because their father had a stroke and now they're worried that they're going to have one too. Are strokes hereditary? They can be, yes. Um, if a stroke runs in a family, then the risk for stroke come, becomes a little bit higher. But that's where we need to do a better job in making sure their blood pressure is under good control. They don't smoke. Smoking is actually a very important risk factor for stroke. So smoking cessation is important. Also, we always, as I said before, we always recommend to people to exercise regularly. Exercise is an excellent reducer of stroke, of, of stroke factors. We have made it easy for people who want to make an appointment with you on um, the number on the screen. We've also may have an easy button to click on at hurleymc.com slash live. Thank you so much uh, for having me uh, tonight. And I, I hope that we can provide some good information for all our public and our, our patients who are watching. I think I'm gonna take a slightly different approach from my colleagues who have done a wonderful job speaking about the COVID-19 risk and problems and concerns that we've all been having about it. And I wanted to point out something very important. While COVID-19 was actually a leading cause of death, in the past few weeks. It's something that is very important. We've been paying a lot of attention to it. Other diseases have not gone away. And if we look at a similar period of time from two years ago, we will find that the majority of deaths have been due to other reasons such as heart disease and cancer. If you look at 2018, about 23% of deaths in the United States of America was due to heart disease. And why do we bring that up? It was very important for us to focus on COVID-19, illnesses, related problems, and on prevention of transmission of this uh, terrible disease. However, during this time, we've noticed something very important. If we look at this particular graph that I have over here, you will see that there's an uptick in the red in the amount of mortality and death from COVID-19. But if you go back two years ago, like I said, you will notice that cancer and heart disease were very prevalent. Well, what happened nowadays? If you look at the amount of registration that we have for myocardial infarction, it has gone down. And it's probably not because it actually went away, 
but we are not paying as much attention to it as public as we did before. So the reason that we are bringing this to your awareness because we have noticed a very dangerous trend. That dangerous trend has to do with the fact that as our patients are feeling symptoms related to heart disease, they have not been addressing it because of fear of transmission of COVID-19. The focus has been mostly on how do I avoid this terrible pandemic that's going on and probably burying down a lot of the other symptoms that can be related to the heart disease or to stroke or to any uh, many other ailments. My job today is to remind myself and everyone else that heart disease is still here. I will give you a few examples to make it simple. Many of the patients that have come to Hurley Medical Center with acute myocardial infarction shared something very interesting and relatively sad that they came late. Their symptoms might have started 24 hours, sometimes 40 to 72 hours before they realized that I must come in. And unfortunately, as Dr. al Kasmi stated earlier that you know time is neurons, also as far as the heart is concerned, time is muscle. Every minute that we delay in presentation to the hospital to take care of this deadly disease is a potential for worsening outcome. That outcome sometimes can be unfortunately death and that outcome sometimes can be simply congestive heart failure and weak heart muscle leaving someone with a lifelong of disability secondary to that. We want you to remember that if you are having symptoms that are related to your heart, such as chest pain, shortness of breath, simply not feeling at the level that you have been before, it is important to think of heart disease and it's important to address it and come to be taken care of. So the first most important message is do not delay your care. Despite everything we've known about COVID-19, we have done a good job at Hurley Medical Center of protecting our patients from transmission. In fact, many units, while the disease was prevalent, was created where the both healthcare providers and patients were protected from transmission to others. We have practiced very safe practices to eliminate that. Well, we want to remember that we want our patients to come and feel safe that if they have a problem, that problem can be taken care of decisively. The other issue that I wanted to bring up, <clears throat> number one killer in the United States, again, is heart disease. So there are many elective procedures or elective symptoms that might not be as urgent as an acute heart attack, but similarly needs to be taken care of in a timely manner. And while the appropriate thing to do as Dr. McDonald said earlier, where we had elective procedures was for us to postpone them. This is the time now for us to readdress those problems and not delay them any further. And we have noticed that amongst our patients that even now that uh, you know the circumstances have improved, there is still a little bit of fear of coming to the hospital to have an elective procedure done. I can speak for the cardiac cath lab at Hurley Medical Center. We have taken uh, great care to protect our patients, to change the environment in the cath labs and discuss with our infectious disease specialists how we can create a negative pressure rooms, how we can have a optimal screening before the patients come in for their symptoms, and how to do a very good job in preventing unnecessary movement within the cath lab in order to reduce any potential for transmission. This has worked very well for our patients. The problem right now is we need to remind our patients that this is available for them. I think the consideration of uh, heart disease is very similar to what Dr. al Kasmi has said earlier. Risk factors exist in our life, everyday life. And this quarantine that we have been through might have uh, predisposed us to one of the two extremes. Some of us have taken it very seriously and have taken up exercise and diet and better lifestyle. But I think a lot of us have taken it to the other uh, situation where we stayed home, we did not exercise as much, and we spent a lot of time with not as optimal of a diet as we should have. And I think this is the time for us to remind ourselves, especially with the weather getting better, that we need to change that around and uh, start paying more attention to our health. 
the variety of heart disease comes in many different ways. I focus particularly on myocardial infarction and acute interventions because this is a passion of mine and this is where we at Hurley Medical Center do a very good job of taking care of those patients. 24 seven, there's an interventional cardiologist on call, but not by himself. There's an interventional cardiology team that is ready to move in at a drop of a hat when we are told that there is a patient coming in with an ST elevation MI. An ST elevation MI is the variety where the blood vessel is completely closed. And this is where the clock starts ticking. We have to move immediately in order to open that artery. Similarly to what happens in the brain, every minute that we delay might cause further damage to the muscle, potentially cause death, and potentially cause disability for a very long time. I think it's everybody who's listening's responsibility to remember that for themselves and for their loved ones. Secondly, there is the variety of patients come with a chest pain and a heart attack where the vessel is not closed. Similarly though, we have to create the optimal conditions so that vessel does not close or at least does not cause reduction in the blood supply to that part of the muscle. The third variety of that is our chronic patients who've had symptoms of congestive heart failure for a long time, and they try to stomach it and manage it at home when they are purely causing them, themselves more distress and potentially worse outcomes. We need those patients to come in and get taken care of. The other variety of heart problems have to do with our heart valves and our electrical system of the heart. Many of our patients have postponed important procedures where they need to have a, an ablation done, a defibrillator implanted, or a pacemaker. I think this is the time for everyone to pay attention to those symptoms, whether they are palpitations, dizziness, passing out, or feeling like you're about to pass out. It is important to talk to your doctor and get referred to a cardiologist so we can have this problem taken care of. The time is very important and we should not delay it. I think in summary, um, we can talk about heart disease in a lot of uh, variety, but the important message that we have tonight that this is the time for us to stop delaying any presentation and seek the help of our healthcare professionals. The second message that I want to give that we have gone to tremendous effort at Hurley Medical Center and especially at the cardiac cath lab to protect our patients and make all our services available to them so we can take care of them, save life, feel better, live longer in a healthy way. I think I'm happy to take any questions. There's a mom on Facebook who uh, unfortunately had a heart attack back in December, but now she's not necessarily worried so much about herself, but she's worried about her children and what's going to happen to them. Are they going to have the same thing? I think it's uh, moms are uh, the, the, the guardians of, uh, of all. And I think it's a, an important question. I can answer that in two ways. Definitely our genetics is uh, something that we cannot, easily change. And I say easily because there is actually a way that we can improve even our genetic predisposition. Yes, any family that have heart disease at a premature age is definitely at risk for other members to have problems. What we need to change to make that less is number one, a lifestyle change, where the environmental factors such as diet and exercise and stress are reduced effectively to change that risk. Number two, we have to do our due diligence. For instance, treatment of cholesterol is not the same for every individual. Uh, it is not tailored that everybody should reach the same number. And this is a, a common misconception. I tell my patients, we have to calculate what your risk is and how far we need to reduce that cholesterol in order to improve your outcome. So therefore, paying attention to those traditional treatable risk factors such as high blood pressure, such as high cholesterol, such as diabetes are also very important. So it's a lifestyle and treatment. The third thing I wanna mention, even though we think that our genetic predisposition is something we have to live with, that's not entirely true. There are certain lifestyle changes that can elongate what's called telomeres. And these are the ending of the DNA, where if they change, they actually effectively have been shown to prolong life. So I'll stop at that, but there's a lot of work that should be done. Another question that's just come in is, what can I do for angina, also high cholesterol and high blood pressure? So let's take this one step at a time. So angina is a word that means chest pain related to blockages in the arteries to the heart for the most part. 
Sometimes it could mean chest pain related to spasm in the arteries that are in the heart. I think the first question that we have to answer, why is this patient having angina? And if they are having angina because of something treatable and fixable, which is 90% of the time, then we must take care of that. So I urge whoever is asking the question to first seek the help of their cardiologist. Now, the second uh, point is what can we do to cholesterol? There's a lot we can do to cholesterol, fortunately. There's a lot of classes of medications that are now available to reduce cholesterol, but we try to follow the guidelines as best as we can. Most importantly, before we get to that treatment, it is important again and again and again to change our lifestyle. The heart likes to be active. It likes to be going. I like to give this example where if you held your hand up and you kept squeezing it 70 times, you're probably going to get tired. Well, imagine that your heart actually never stops for your entire life. It likes to be active. Um, here's another question off of Facebook. How often should I have my stent checked? That's a, a wonderful question. The answer to that, you don't. What you need to follow is your symptoms, how you feel and how you are changing your risk factors. There is no such thing as I have to go get my stent checked because even treatment for that depends on how you feel. Improvement in outcomes depend on how the patients feel. Stents don't actually change the outcome, they change how you feel. What cardiac procedures can be done at Hurley? That's a, and a, a question that is dear to my heart because we have been working on this for a very, very long time. And I can honestly say that at Hurley Medical Center Cardiac Cath Lab, we can cover almost the full spectrum of any cardiac procedure that people need, whether it's cardiac catheterization, angioplasty and stenting, pacemaker implantation, defibrillator implantation, or even right-sided heart ablation for arrhythmias such as SVT and atrial flutter. I know these words might not mean specific uh, meaning to certain people unless they've had to deal with that problem, but I think the message to take home, almost the full spectrum of heart disease can be treated at Hurley. What we cannot treat at Hurley, we have created a very clear partnership where we can triage our patients to their best option possible. I think people like uh, having you here to be able to interact with you and ask you these questions. We have another question that came in about aspirin. Um, someone's saying there was an article about not taking aspirin. What do you think about that? So primary prevention means taking a medication without having the disease. And in the past, it's been a common advice that we tell someone you should take aspirin to prevent complications of heart disease. As far as heart disease is concerned, however, it's been shown that if you've never had a heart problem, taking aspirin might actually be harmful. And I know that this is a change from what's common uh, conception we've had. It, probably about two years ago, we've had three major studies and three major articles that came out that said, don't take aspirin if you do not have heart disease or if you do not have a different indication for it. So at this point, we are not recommending primary prevention. Now, if you did have heart disease, then it's unquestionable that you need to take aspirin or if you take aspirin for a different indication. How long will a stent last? A stent can last forever. Well, to put it mildly, a stent is placed in the heart to keep the artery open and it's embedded in the inside tissue of the heart that we call the intima. So unless regrowth inside the stent happens, the stent simply becomes part of the wall of the artery. Uh, I think this is the last question for you, and uh, it's probably important because a lot of these questions are coming in from women. Um, do women have the same symptoms as men when it comes to heart attacks? Okay, so uh, as much as we think that uh, we are different, we are more alike than different than we think. So uh, I think the best way to say it, unfortunately, women have all the symptoms that men can have and then some. And what I mean by that is that they can have a very atypical symptoms, an atypical presentation, where it's usually not the same with men. I like to say that women are from, uh, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, and you know, men have read the book, exactly. Uh, I have chest pains going up to my arm. That can happen to women as well, but unfortunately it can also be something completely different and simple as tightness or weakness 
or um, aches or pains of lesser significance. So I would urge uh, all my female patients and anyone that, that I encounter is to, to be more vigilant when it comes to that. As we send you off, I, I do want to mention, I see a comment here and it says, I love and appreciate Dr. El Khattab. He has put my mind at ease so many times. Excellent, wow. Doc. And I hope that's, that's what we're That's very doing. sweet. Thank you so much. I Thank you, whoever made that. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. today whenever you get around to making that appointment or you know asking the questions that you need we do want to thank you so much for joining us tonight we hope you have an amazing evening and please stay healthy